the second uh, part uh, of the evening, confrontation and cooperation in the European neighborhood. So the structure is, first we're gonna do some big conceptual questions about the liberal order, and then the questions regarding the neighborhood. Uh, in fact, there's overlap, and I think you should feel free in the course of the discussion to continue that. But l let me uh, be begin by introducing our panelists. Uh, first of all, Michael Lay, who this year is at the Transatlantic Academy working on their project on religion and, and politics. Uh, he's a senior uh, fellow at the Transatlantic Academy then, and he's been the senior advisor to the German Marshall Fund since 2011. Uh, Dr. Lay was Director General uh, of the Enlargement at the European Commission and Council of Ministers from 2006 to 2011, so it's, I can't imagine somebody with more experience in the questions of the European neighborhood, and was indeed a theorist, if you want, a practitioner of that policy, um, the chief European Union negotiator with candidate countries, and I know he has a lot of thoughts about uh, that experience. Then I'd like to introduce Christina Lin, uh, who's at the Center for Transatlantic Relations at Johns Hopkins. Uh, Christina Lin is a fellow at the Center for Tra was is a fellow. I'm sorry at the Center for Transatlantic Relations at the uh, School of Advanced International Studies at Johns SICE at Johns Hopkins, uh, as well as 2013-2014 senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund's Transatlantic. Academy, when she focused on China's increasing footprint in the Mediterranean basin. And this, I think, was probably what captured my eye and said, ah, yes, I have indeed visited the container ship port in Naples, and it is a marvelous structure, and it belongs to the Chinese, you know, with some Swiss, but mainly, mainly Chinese. Uh, so, uh, Christine has also worked on ways that China, NATO, and U.S. allies can cooperate to resolve regional security issues. Um, Katarina Pishikova is at, from Cornell University, and thank you very much for coming down, a visiting scholar at the Center for International Studies there. She's also Associate Professor of Political Science at eCampus University, an open university in Italy. I'd like to learn more about that. Uh, her research focuses on issues of democratization and the role of civil society in political transformations, as well as uh, democracy promotion. Then I'd like to uh, introduce our two commentators from Columbia, because the idea was that we would have commentators mix it all up and bring all of you in. Uh, Cynthia Roberts, uh, who is an associate professor of political science at Hunter, uh, but we are also very, very happy to have you here as adjunct associate professor dealing with all kinds of important security issues. Uh, she's the author of a book on Russia and the European Union, uh, The Special Relationship, The Limits and Sources of That. She's a specialist on contemporary and historical aspects of European security. Some of you might know her because she's uh, developed a capstone on NATO, which is something we'd want to keep her teaching. And Jack Snyder, colleague in the political science department, uh, the Belfer Professor of International Relations, and he's also at the Saltman Institute for War and Peace Studies at Columbia. And his research focuses on international relations theory, uh, but he has also a recent book which includes Electing to Fight, why Emerging Democracies Go to War, which has been co-authored with uh, Edward Mansfield. So let's begin. I'm going to have t 10 minutes each and then some comments, and then uh, we will open up again to discussion. Thank you. Let's uh, start. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's sit here. Well, thank you very much indeed for inviting us uh, to this very interesting session and for your words of welcome. Uh, I'm going to try in 10 minutes, which is a tall order, um, to share with you some thoughts about Europe's neighborhood policy. After all, it was to some extent the failure of this policy that led to the developments that we've seen subsequently in uh, Ukraine and in some of the neighboring countries. And um, where do we go from here? It was the uh, refusal of President Yanukovych to sign the new association agreement with the European Union that was the proximate cause for the uh, demonstrations in the Maidan from, for his uh, ouster um, and all subsequent events. So I think it's very interesting to look at this against the background of uh, how this policy developed and what the aspirations were behind it and why they did not succeed and where perhaps we go from here. 
in 2003, the European Union was about to expand from uh, 17 to um, eventually 27 and then 28 member states. And on the eve of this enlargement, the member states thought it would be a good thing to send a message to the countries that were not involved in this process, that enlargement was not turned against them, that the relations that had previously existed, for example, between the new member states in Eastern Europe, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, who bordered on Ukraine, would not come to a crashing halt, that Europe would not become a fortress. There was a second set of motivations for a new policy, and that was after the accession of Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and so on. This is often forgotten. There was considerable concern in some member states that the next country to apply for membership might be Ukraine. So the origins, in fact, of this association agreement were not so much the EU trying to draw Ukraine into membership, but rather to create an alternative framework for, for, for relations with Ukraine, something perhaps that we didn't really get across in subsequent years. The goal of this policy, as stated at the time, was to create a ring of well-governed states around the European Union. In The Economist two weeks ago, the new Charlemagne uh, uh, commentator, Tom Nuttall, said instead of um, a ring of well-governed states, we have a ring of fire. So what happened? The vision that the European Union put forward in 2003, 2004, with what started as the wider Europe policy and then became the European neighborhood policy, was basically to offer countries to the east, Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, if it fulfilled some basic democratic conditions that, of course, it has not. Um, later on, the countries of the southern Caucasus and then at the insistence of our southern member states, particularly Spain, the countries around the Mediterranean uh, rim, a new framework for our relations. The idea in a nutshell was that we would ask these countries to commit themselves to a series of political and economic reforms rather similar to those that we had demanded from the new member states in exchange for which the European Union would open up some of its policies, the single market, it would provide additional financial assistance, it would facilitate mobility in a kind of step-by-step -step move. The European Union uh, negotiators, including myself at the time, went round all the countries concerned and negotiated action plans in which they signed up to very ambitious reforms. This was still with the Ancien Regime, of course, in Eastern Europe, there had been the Orange Revolution, but uh, around the Mediterranean we were dealing still with the Ben Ali's and the Mubarak's and so on. But nonetheless, they signed up to ambitious reforms and we promised them all kinds of uh, benefits um, in return. Ten years later, we can see that uh, these ambitions somehow to benefit from the enlargement experience by sharing the same methodology with the next group of states who inevitably, in our view at the time, little by little would wish to draw closer to the European Union, um, failed. And I think it failed for a number of reasons. One of the reasons was that we had no vision of where this policy was headed. What was the end state? Were we thinking of something like the European economic area? It wasn't quite clear. Was this meant to be an antechamber to membership? Not really, but couldn't be excluded for some uh, European countries. So there was uncertainty as to where this was leading, but it was pretty clear that it was not leading to membership. So the main incentive that the EU had to offer to the countries in Central and Eastern Europe for far-reaching reforms was uh, lacking. Another problem from the very beginning was the uh, split between the European institutions on the one side and the member states on the other. In a way, the member states, through this policy, had delegated to the EU institutions the kind of values policy, the export of our legal structures, of our norms, of our values, while they pretty much got on with business as usual, basing their policy on traditional state interests. That's why governments are elected. They did their job, in a way, in which security, trade, and access to energy was uppermost in their mind, a classic case which illustrated to me 
this dual approach, which is one of the reasons why the policy failed to work, was just uh, a year or so ago when a former colleague of mine from the Commission, now a Greek minister, was in Baku um, lobbying the government in Azerbaijan uh, in favor of the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline rather than the EU project of Nabucco West. And he was engaging with this government, which uh, in Freedom House's most recent report was described, perhaps with some exaggeration, as one of the most repressive regimes in the world. And the European Commissioner concerned, Stefan Fuller, at that moment got up while my friend uh, on behalf of the Greek government was in Baku, attacked the government for putting two uh, uh, opposition uh, 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 leaders in prison the same day. So the attitude of the member state, you know, why are you screwing up our bilateral relations? Whereas in fact they had delegated to the EU the task of exporting uh, our values and trying to get these countries to commit themselves to far-reaching reforms. Another reason why this policy didn't really uh, achieve uh, its goals was um, the lack of clarity in communicating to the beneficiaries and also to others um, some of the fundamental features of this policy. And in the case of Ukraine, this failure of communication, I think, was one of the key factors that led to the disastrous series of events that we've seen subsequently. In 2008, after um, the Bucharest NATO summit, when it became clear after Russian objections that uh, Georgia and Ukraine were not going to join the European Union, Poland and Sweden put forward the plan for this Eastern Partnership, which was a sort of local module of the neighborhood policy, with as its core a very far-reaching, deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. And the EU then spent four years negotiating this agreement. Now, talking about clarity and communication, this was a free trade agreement, but with a very important element of regulatory convergence. This agreement was entirely uh, compatible with the existing agreement between Ukraine and the CIS, the, the free trade agreement. It would not have been compatible with Ukraine joining the customs union. But this didn't get across, and nor did it get across that the EU, on, far from seeking the membership of Ukraine, was putting forward an alternative vision to this. So there, I think, there were extremely um, mixed messages. Another reason for the failure of this policy, particularly in the Mediterranean region, was um, taking commitments by ancien regime leaders at face value and assuming that they really did intend to implement these reforms. In a, in, in a new version of the old Soviet joke, it looked as if these countries were pretending to reform and we were pretending to take them into the single market and extend many of these benefits. So I think for a myriad of reasons, applying the enlargement methodology in the absence of an offer of membership without clarity as to the end goals and with the member states entertaining one type of discourse and the EU institutions another, are among the factors why this policy did not produce a ring of well-governed states, but rather a ring of fire. Another major deficiency was the absence of strategic vision. There was no understanding of how this policy would be perceived in Russia, and there was no dialogue with Russia concerning the policy. There was an atmosphere of triumphalism after the enlargement in 2004. It was an amazing achievement, the reunification of the European continent to a considerable extent under the umbrella of NATO and of the EU. And we were on a kind of high. Even later, I think, when the Arab uprisings began, we thought, this confirms our vision. The Berlin Wall has fallen one more time. We've done this before in Central Europe. We'll do it again in North Africa and the Levant. We know how it works. We can support transition. And all this under the umbrella of the neighborhood policy. But I think from the purposes of today's discussion and thinking about some of the main challenges to our security, the Russia angle is perhaps uh, predominant. It's also the next subject that the Transatlantic Academy will, will look at next year um, in its program. And after 2008 and the Bucharest summit, the EU le leaders simply assumed that it was okay with Moscow to see the EU engaging very deeply with CIS countries. NATO was not okay, but 
um, the EU was okay. And the Russians contributed to this. They did not uh, initially voice any objections. And it was only when the agreements were very advanced and almost ready for signature that it became clear that this was perceived as the EU really treading on the toes of Russia in its own neighborhood and in countries that it perceived as part of its uh, sphere of influence. And by then, of course, the cat was out of the bag. It was rather uh, too late. And this then led to the series of events that we uh, are now familiar with, ending up with these very severe sanctions, um, which mean that close dialogue between the EU, or the US for that matter, and Russia is now precluded, at least for the next year, two years, three years, before the dust has uh, settled and, and tempers have calmed. And yet, of course, we do need to engage with Russia on so many issues, whether Iran, where the process still continues, Syria, or other cases, where being in this hostile relationship with Russia clearly does not uh, serve our, our purpose. So the new um, EU high representative for foreign and security policy, who will take office next month in November, if all goes well, with the hearings in the European Parliament, will have this neighborhood policy at the top of her agenda. Because if the EU cl can claim to have any sort of foreign policy, if it can claim to exercise influence in the political world commensurate with its economic weight, this is first and foremost in its own neighborhood. And therefore, I think a radical review, a new strategic approach to the neighborhood is really top of the new foreign policy chief's uh, agenda. I have my own ideas as to where this uh, policy should go. We don't have the time to go into them in much detail, but in a word, I think we need a meeting place with the very pragmatic, realistic approach of the member states and the hitherto idealistic approach of the EU institutions, which was, uh, in fact, uh, not in line with the discourse maintained by the member states. I think that energy and security and trade need to be at the heart of our policy, not giving up on uh, support for democratic uh, forces where they exist and where the demand is there in the countries themselves, as, for example, in Tunisia but setting aside the idea that we can impose, in some sense, respect for human rights, for democracy, for the rule of law from outside. We can respond to civil society forces, to governments requesting such support, but we can't impose it from outside. And this is a, mod a, a kind of step towards a greater degree of modesty about our own influence in countries beyond um, our own frontiers. And to finish, we also need a much more highly differentiated policy. There's no use having a common framework for countries as diverse as Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, Israel, Syria, which is covered by this policy, Jordan, um, as well as uh, Ukraine, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and so on. And a final thought is whether the concept of neighborhood in other words, directly contiguous countries, is really a policy-relevant framework. When you look at the situation today and the threats to security that the EU and the West in general are facing in the Levant, for example, Syria and Iraq are now viewed as, in many respects, posing a similar challenge for all the obvious reasons. Syria is part of the EU's neighborhood policy. Iraq uh, is not. So did we choose the right geographical framework for this policy? There are many other questions, but I think this is an item top of our agenda, and I'm sure there will be um, a great focus on this in the hearings before the European Parliament uh, this week uh, and next, and in the months and years ahead. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, Lincoln European Institute for hosting us for this event. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, engaging China in governance of security issues. Um, this is based on my chapter in the report on uh, the role of partnerships to strengthen um, the West as an as a anchor to engage emerging powers. 
China's rise and uh, its role in global governance has been a subject of a great deal of debate in the uh, past decade, whether uh, in the economic realm or security realm in the global commons. But there seems to be more divergence uh, on economic governance given China's penchant for state capitalism or supporting alternative blocs such as BRICS or SCO um, to bypass international institutions of, of WTO, IMF, and so on. And so my chapter um, focuses on the security realm where uh, I think there's more convergence of interests. I focus specifically on engaging China on uh, emerging non-traditional security challenges such as energy and maritime security, uh, counterterrorism, and arresting WMD proliferation. Uh, my Britt had actually covered some of the non-traditional security challenges in her uh, presentation. Um, because I think that this is where the West and China have a lot of common ground to forge a normative consensus. And despite some debates on Europe jointly pivoting with the US to engage China in Asia, I focus on the transatlantic community engaging China much closer to home in Europe's own neighborhood in the Mediterranean. So uh, let me first discuss why US and Europe should engage China on these new security challenges in the Mediterranean, and then I'll expound on what are Chinese interests in this region and provide some examples of um, how we can engage in cooperative security with China to help shape a new security architecture in the Arab Spring aftermath. So why should we engage China in the Mediterranean first and not in Asia? It was at the EU and US summit in, 20, in November 2011 that transatlantic partners initially discussed ideas of a joint pivot to Asia, and actually NATO is debating um, an Asia pivot as well, and upgrading ties with Asian global partners such as Japan and South Korea, Australia and New Zealand post NATO ISAF in Afghanistan. But in view of declining uh, defense budgets, many European countries see Asia as a region too far and prefer division of labor or division of tasks <laughs> to focus on territorial defense and own backyard, such as the Ukraine crisis in Europe's neighborhood. Southern European countries especially fear destabilizing spillovers in Middle East and North Africa or MENA, such as mass migration and terrorism in Syria and Iraq with the current ISIS threat, as well as energy and maritime disputes in the Eastern Mediterranean with Turkey, Cyprus, and Greece. Nonetheless, I think a transatlantic division of labor raises questions of practicality on whether Europe can secure its neighborhood without U.S. support, as we saw in Libya. And this also risks weakening the transatlantic bond over time. So we don't all agree in, in you know, various chapters in the report. <laughs> um, ironically, China's rise and global presence offers a silver lining to resolve this dilemma. Because while US has been pivoting east to Asia, as I mentioned earlier, China has been pivoting west and has joined Club Med uh, by increasing its economic and maritime footprint in the Mediterranean. So this presents a rare opportunity, I think, for the US and Europe to constructively engage China on security issues and together form a common strategy for regional stabilization and reconstruction. Here the transatlantic community can engage China in what I call a partnership of necessity, meaning engaging with countries that don't necessarily share our values but have shared interests like regional stability. While we work with um, like-minded allies with shared values and a partnership of choice to then uh, shape a new Mediterranean security architecture that is still anchored in a liberal West. I think a partnership of necessity is possible with China because despite our differences on issues such as human rights, responsibility to protect, or rule of law, the Atlantic community and China share convergent interests in MENA on non-traditional challenges such as maritime security, especially in counterterrorism and crisis management. Now let me outline why and how is China increasing its presence in MENA. For Beijing, MENA is first and foremost a region of energy sources to feed the growing Chinese economy that underwrites Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy and survival. It is also an export hub onto Europe and Africa and a forward front to promote Beijing's one-China policy, as well as to combat terrorism and separatists in China's Muslim province of Xinjiang. The Arab Spring had caught China by surprise, and after losing $20 billion in Libya and evacuating 36,000 Chinese nationals, Beijing is primarily concerned about deterring another Libya case and protecting its interests and security of Chinese citizens abroad. So China has become more, more proactive uh, in the Levant and Eastern Mediterranean to protect its interests with three U UN Security Council vetoes on Syria, as we saw in 2012, dispatches warships to conduct joint naval war games with Russia, 
uh, in the East Med uh, back in January this year. And then we saw them also conduct naval war games with um, Iran in the Persian Gulf last week. Um, they've upgraded ties with the U.S. ally Israel, uh, lobby to play a role in the Middle East peace process, and they're asserting their economic, diplomatic, and political footprint to help maintain regional stability. And stability is very important in Chinese foreign policy. They always talk about Wei Wen, maintaining stability. Um, so they have a definite stake in, in, in this region. China and regional actors uh, also share similar threats of Islamic extremism. Beijing fears new Islamist regimes in the Arab states will be more supportive of Uyghur separatists in Xinjiang and deny uh, Beijing's access to their energy supply. It especially fears Chinese jihadists in Syria and Iraq garnering support from international terror groups and returning to attack Chinese territory, as well as spawn homegrown radicalization of China's 20 million Sunni Muslims. It's a little known fact, but China's internal state security, um, uh, internal security budget for the Ministry of State Security is actually greater than its defense budget, even though the Pentagon's obsessed with the defense budget. But its internal security budget is greater than its defense budget since the 2009 Xinjiang uprising. So Beijing will increasingly exercise its diplomatic and military power to combat terror and protect its core interest. Beijing is also um, is, uh, increasing its military presence post-Libyan losses by investing in various Mediterranean seaports, I spoke about this earlier, um, that can accommodate larger uh, cargo ships and naval vessels. Concerned about security of energy supplies, China has also sent troops under UN banner to maintain regional stability. So it's not just in Africa that they have a lot of UN peacekeeping missions, it's also increasingly in the, in the Mediterranean. Already there are 1,000 Chinese troops in Lebanon, and in Cyprus, the UN peacekeeping mission was until August under the, com the command of a Chinese general. China deployed 500 troops, including combat troops, for the first time to the UN mission in Mali last year to help stabilize neighboring OPEC member Algeria, where they have more than 50,000 workers, which is more than they have in, Syria, in uh, Libya. Uh, and they discussed possibly offering troops to the West Bank under a UN banner before the recent Hamas and Israeli conflict. Given Western democracy's diminishing capability to continue being the sole provider of the global liberal order in which China has greatly benefited, this is a good opportunity for China to step up to the plate and help share uh, burden sharing. Just last year, China overtook US as the world's largest trading nation with, uh, so with its global economic interests as a trading state and expanding presence in MENA, China has an even bigger stake to ensure maritime security and freedom of navigation in the global commons. And we already see this in their anti-piracy um, task force in the Gulf of Aden. They are very interested in maintaining open sea lines of communication because um, most trade are, are seaborne, 80, 88% or 90%, 95% seaborne. So they have a, a stake in maintaining um, freedom of navigation and, and open sea lines. So how do we operationalize this, this, um, operationalize this cooperation in uh, Europe's neighborhood? Well, regional stakeholders in the Eastern Mediterranean, such as NATO and its Mediterranean dialogue partners, can engage China in energy and maritime security, and I choose NATO rather than EU because transatlantic relations remain institutionalized on security issues within NATO. In the East Med, large gas discoveries off Israel and Cyprus have drawn the attention of Lebanon and Hezbollah, Turkey, Greece, Iran, US, EU, Russia, and China, so it's a, a motley crew of um, stakeholders there, with potential military conflict over maritime disputes in the Levantine Basin, akin to current territorial disputes in the East and South China Sea. China is already eyeing to build a LNG export terminal in Cyprus and express interest in joint development of Israel's Leviathan gas fields. So China has a stake in maintaining energy and maritime security in the East Med. Now, some skeptics may doubt this idea and point to China's aggressive behavior in the Western Pacific and unilateral declarations of air defense identification zone, the ADIS, as well as redefining customary international law over the exclusive economic zone. And it's true the Western Pacific is um, uh, rife with longstanding historic rivalries between China and, and its neighbors, you, you know, U.S. Asian allies, making it very difficult to engage China for confidence building measures in this region. But U.S. and NATO engagement with China in the Mediterranean would not feed China's suspicion of encirclement. China's always talking about encirclement uh, in the Western Pacific. But in the Med, it's more neutral. They, they don't have any territorial claims here, and it's geographically far away. So I think it's a very fertile area for cooperation. 
Counterterrorism in MENA is another corroborative security issue given Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. The ACUM is a shared threat by NATO's Mediterranean dialogue partners as well as China. Um, in 2009, uh, ACUM actually attacked Chinese interests in, in Algeria after the Xinjiang uprising. And in Syria and Iraq, China also faces um, Uyghur jihadists linked with Al Qaeda affiliates and ISIS that threaten Xinjiang stability and territorial integrity. And China estimates there are uh, about 100 uh, Chinese jihadists in, um, in ISIS. NATO and China can also cooperate in crisis management and emergency response. China has almost one million citizens in the Middle East and Africa where piracy and kidnapping are an increasing problem. To conclude, China's increasing interest in MENA due to uh, energy security concerns as well as the need to protect its overseas citizens um, given this, I think U.S. and NATO engagement with China in the Mediterranean is a way to move forward, both for uh, transatlantic cohesion as well as regional stability post Arab Spring. And after using this region as a, a, a laboratory for establishing cooperative mechanisms and confidence-building measures with China, U.S. and European um, allies can then take lessons learned and best practices from this Mediterranean template and then uh, jointly pivot to Asia to resolve um, you know, to, to solve security challenges in the global commons and encourage China to resolve these issues with rules-based rather than power-based solutions. And then perhaps, you know, using this template to then uh, pivot to Arctic or elsewhere where China also has a lot of interest in energy and maritime uh, security. Thank you. Yes, hello, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming, thank you for hosting us here. An extremely interesting and wide-ranging discussion. Um, I will, would like to, I won't take much time, but I would like to say a few words um, on the topic of this panel, which is about the um, confrontation and cooperation in the neighborhood, focusing specifically on the Eastern um, European neighborhood. Uh, I won't go into any detail on the Ukraine crisis specifically, but I've I uh, followed it quite closely, so if there's um, interest, we can have that, uh, keep that for the discussion. Um, so let me just take a few, make a few comments about the paradoxes um, underlying the patterns of cooperation and confrontation in the, um, to the east from the European Union. Um, I was greatly helped by the previous speaker who outlined uh, sort of the European model for the cooperation that evolved over the past um, decade or so. Um, but there are um, two, as I mentioned, two tensions or paradoxes here. One um, is that um, among the new neighbors uh, of the European Union after the big enlargement of 2004, um, there's clearly one that um, is different, is much more uh, important, has much more weight and, and a whole different role in the region um, than the others, and that is Russia. And that is very clear if you, we look at the uh, bilateral relations between uh, EU member states and Russia, but somehow the EU regional policy conceived in Brussels um, was followed um, a rationale that somehow um, Russia didn't really matter or existed. Um, so it really, um, there is really, I agree, a failure to recognize Russia as a regional power um, in, in Europe's own neighborhood. Um, and so also lack of coherence is in treating it as such. And so that is clearly um, a strategic failure. More specifically, um, uh, in terms of the uh, regional, this uh, neighborhood policy and what it offered, um, what we have seen is that um, possibly um, due to sort of a kind of path dependency, possibly um, due to the existing sort of um, institutional expertise, it was largely modeled on the enlargement policy, even though, um, as the previous speaker ex explained quite well, there was never really um, the membership offer on the table. But that had um, an enormous um, political implication because what the association agreements that triggered the crisis, um, the potential signature of which triggered the crisis, um, entailed was a far-reaching cooperation and uh, regulatory approximation um, that was similar to the one in enlargement but um, so it was offered in that way uh, without really um, thinking that this might not be the only offer on the table to those uh, partner countries, um, unlike in the case of enlargement. I mean, in the case of enlargement, there was no competing uh, model or no uh, need to reconcile different patterns of cooperation for the partner states involved. And this was not the case, obviously, with the uh, Eastern Partnership Project. 
um, which completely overlook the fact that there are uh, very specific regional interdependencies, very specific regional uh, vulnerabilities, um, existing patterns of cooperation which might not probably be the most beneficial in the long term, but they were not going to go away in the uh, short and medium term. And this is something that um, was not addressed. So what happened, just to summarize, was that this very heavily technical project, obviously as, as it was moving along, was increasingly politicized. Um, and this politicization was not, um, as it clashed with all these regional dynamics, um, but there were no really adequate tools to address um, uh, these concerns early on, way before the crisis erupted. And um, uh, as experts indeed point out, some of the uh, concerns about the issues of trade compatibility, these were all um, easily resolvable had they been resolved um, earlier on. Um, but that also means that we're talking, you know, nothing's technical in politics. We're talking also about, again, the lack of strategy and political will to actually see this um, as a political question, as something to address, as something to push forward to, the, 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 this sort of new models of cooperation and recon uh, how to reconcile different uh, patterns of cooperation um, in the region. And this brings me to the question of the confrontation in the neighborhood, which is increasingly um, the name of the game. Um, and we can see um, probably a bit less in the US, but this is um, uh, extremely uh, now um, important in, in, in Europe, um, that the current crisis is increasingly being discussed in terms of Russia being the new, the old, the emerging security threat um, to uh, the new EU member states, to the EU as a whole, to the transatlantic community, to the post-Cold World order, you know, you can get as ambitious as you like in terms of the, how far you want to push the implications of this new threat. But it's, what's important is that we're really, um, the debate is increasingly moving towards uh, uh, this new discussion of, of, of Russia as a security threat. Um, clearly, Russia has done a lot to, um, to actually promote uh, those kinds of, um, uh, that kind of debate and those kinds of discussions with its deeds, but I would argue also a lot with its particular positioning, with its particular rhetoric uh, on the international arena. Um, we have to give credit to the transatlantic community that tried to um, smoothen the terms of the debate, uh, offering off-ramps and, and, and um, settlements, at least in the beginning, before it got really um, too, too difficult to, um, to be trying to seek a compromise. Um, but what I would like to highlight here are the implications of the fact that the discussion got so securitized. Um, and I think the first one is that the more we discuss, um, the more securitized the discussion is, the more it actually benefits the status quo in the eastern neighborhood. And by the status quo in the eastern neighborhood at the moment, what we mean is um, limited sovereignty throughout the region, frozen conflicts throughout the region, dysfunctional states throughout the region, Ukraine is clearly a new um, horrifying example, but we actually have a whole pattern throughout the region. We have Moldova with its frozen uh, conflict zone. We have uh, the situation in Georgia with South Ossetia. We have the escalation of conflict um, around Nagorno-Karabakh between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. We have a whole um, range of tensions and insecurities in Central Asia that are, might um, just as well erupt as we are speaking. Um, and what that means is basically that as the security stakes go up for, uh, for the region and by implication also for the neighbors, for the European Union, the focus of engagement in the region uh, shifts towards containment, de-escalation, quick as possible settlements of uh, really tense situations, and inevitably it moves away from um, addressing the structural causes of these problems. Um, and of the crisis itself. Um, and so uh, I think this is something that's being overlooked really in this discussion is that um, although um, the, the crisis may have been triggered by this new geopolitical rivalry, um, if we look at the domestic stakeholders um, in the conflict, in Ukraine, in Russia, throughout the region, if we look at the kind of um, really uh, possible ways of addressing this issue really in the longer term as opposed to just sort of making sure there's a ceasefire that holds. Um, all of that is obviously completely off the table now because of the um, securitization of the whole problem. And that clearly benefits the model of Russian regional governance. And it also fits with its own model of development. I mean, Russia itself is a corrupt and, and you know, in many ways, dysfunctional state. And so 
you know, it sort of uh, fits with its uh, preferred um, governance pattern. Um, and it, so what has happened, I would argue, <coughs> is that the, the crisis in Ukraine reframed the uh, broader policy in the region from one of uh, cooperation to, to the one of uh, sort of threat containment. And so what does that mean really to just to tie quickly um, the discussion um, to the questions of, you know, bigger questions of foreign policy, bigger questions of grand strategy, if we, like to, if we would like to call it that way, um, for the West, for the transatlantic community, for the EU more specifically, um, you know, how do we rec reconcile now this um, sudden emerging pressure to, to deal with the, um, to contain a security threat with what used to be um, the, 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 the sort of the tenets of um, the foreign policy, which, you know, labels, labels differ. Some people talk about liberal foreign policy, some people talk about idealist foreign policy. But basically a foreign policy which was uh, much more normatively charged, much more proactive and much more interventionist even, if you like. A foreign policy that well, used to be um, much more ambitiously uh, aiming at promoting a certain model of governance and the structural changes that go with it. And so I think the bigger question that we um, really have to be thinking about as we look at this crisis in the Eastern neighborhood is really will the new neighborhood policy be about the former or the latter? Is it really about pragmatic threat containment or is it still about um, a more, um, more, a different kind of engagement? And if a different kind of engagement is still on the table, how then can we pursue it in a credible and effective manner uh, given the recent developments? And I'll stop there. So thank you, panelists. I'm going to uh, try and make some comments that draw on both the report and some of what you've said while resisting uh, getting into the Ukraine issue too much, uh, leaving that maybe for Q&A. I should start by saying I'm really happy to be here because this whole uh, project combines two questions that I've been working on for a long time. One, the whole question of what is a liberal order, which we struggled with a little bit in the first session. Uh, I, six years ago, uh, started work on a project that then became a special issue of the journal Polity called Challengers or Stakeholders, the BRICS and the Liberal World Order. So we also struggled to define this, and I'll say a word about that. Uh, and the other project that I've worked on for years and years is European security in Russia. And I think actually Russia's pivot to a BRICS strategy has been connected to the failure of its ability to find a, uh, a relationship with the West that it found satisfactory. Let me start by saying something about order. Uh, it, as a kind of realist in international relations, my view of order is norms and values go together with power. And so we can speak of a Euro-Atlantic order uh, underpinned by US power and to a large extent European economic power, but the whole idea of a liberal order in a global sense was of course came uh, into being as a question after the end of the Cold War, war when the aspiration was to try and integrate um, the former Soviet countries and uh, additionally following that a rising China into a Western conception of a rule-based order. And um, in my sense, this is, in my view, this is not something we've actually achieved, and I don't think it's possible to achieve to integrate um, uh, non-rule-based, basically illiberal states, whether they're rising powers, re-emerging powers, or Russia is both rising and declining throughout its whole history, is a separate question. Um, but it's an aspiration, and it's a good aspiration, but we need to be pragmatic about it. And the Russia case, and where we are today, I think is reflective of the problem uh, of doing this. Uh, initially, if we look back to what happened on the Russia side, leaving the China side uh, for a minute uh, apart, the Russia case, Russia was so weak after the Soviet collapse that it was not too difficult for the West to move into integrating Central European countries, the European Union, European states in Western Europe, of course, were not so eager to do this. They were more engaged in a deepening exercise and not so interested in widening Europe. 
uh, and that's why NATO came before the EU. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a good argument to stabilize Central Europe and prevent a vacuum power. Russia wasn't thrilled with this idea, but it didn't have the power to prevent it. And as a kind of side payment to Russia, we tried to encourage Russia uh, to democratize. We tried to, uh, we the United States in particular, but also uh, the European Union tried to partner with Russia. And I wrote a whole mo uh, monograph on this and argued that these, these special relationships or uh, partial integration strategies can only work when Russia was weak. And when it recovered its power, it was going to be more assertive uh, and question whether this kind of order could work. And that's, in fact, what we've seen. Um, Russia deeply resented, I don't think it feared so much as a security element, NATO's enlargement or EU enlargement until it got to uh, Ukraine and Georgia and countries particularly on the, uh, from the former Soviet Union. Um, but it resented the fact that it was excluded and did not seem to understand that Russia could not be integrated into this order that was value-based, whether Russia-EU partnership or Russia-NATO partnership, uh, on its terms. And those terms were not rule-based, but in fact a lack of conditionality. Russia's idea of order is rather more like a concert of Europe, where great powers have spheres of influence and are the major uh, power players and rule makers in the world, and smaller states like Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, and so on, uh, are basically part of great power spheres. And they adjusted to the fact the EU existed, but they were never happy about the fact that they were excluded. And eventually, we saw this reflected in Medvedev's plan for a new security arrangement in Europe, both in the context of Russia, NATO, and Russia, EU. Russia began to realize it had no bargaining power with the EU or NATO. It could only hope to bargain for a new agreement. And of course, neither NATO nor the EU was interested in an overarching structure where Russia would play an equal role. So this is where we're at, and then the uh, problematic way of dealing with Ukraine has led to a situation where Russia has now, uh, where we've seen a power shift. And despite its current economic problems, we have to remember, before 2008, Russia had gone through a period where its power had recovered, and we had a Russian economy about the size of Germany. In fact, all of the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, leaving aside South Africa, are now in the top 10 world economies, and they are interested in having uh, the power and influence that goes with this. Um, so on the Russia side, this is not a difficult explanation, and Europe and the transatlantic community is still left with the challenge, I've argued, that is the challenge that confronted us at the end of the Cold War. How do we uh, uh, deal with uh, an assertive, uh, illiberal country that is not, that wants to play a role, and yes, we do have shared interests in some respects, uh, but not on our terms. And this is the same challenge, it's just now with a stronger Russia with a modernized, uh, I don't want to overstate its modernized military power, but at least the tip of it. On the China side, let me just say a couple words before I turn it over to Jack. Um, here, the whole notion of integrating China as a responsible stakeholder has been in the forefront because China is the rising power. Russia is the failed challenger. And it's still a problem in the European context, and we shouldn't underestimate it, but it's not the challenger that China is. To their credit, it was the Russian, it was actually Putin uh, himself and the foreign ministry that, that had their own pivot to create this BRICS idea and most of my colleagues gave me a lot of flack for even thinking this was a project worth working on. But here we are now, six years later, and uh, the BRICS countries that have literally nothing in common on completely different continents uh, through a kind of act of jujitsu uh, and a very clever, I would argue, Russian diplomatic strategy have come together and started to form parallel institutions to the existing governance structures in the world. And this is a really remarkable development, and I think Russia was in part motivated, as I said, because it wasn't getting any traction on its US-Russian or European-Russian uh, uh, side. 
So on that sense, these BRICS countries actually have a lot in common. They have a deep resentment, and I include in the democratic countries, India and Brazil, not just the resurgent, powerful, growing powerful China, which uh, is of course the dominant player now, and uh, Russia with all of its problems. They have a deep resentment against the fact that the sort of legacy powers, not the United States, which is still the dominant power, but the legacy powers in Europe um, are trying to encourage the emulation of norms, but still sitting on their established positions and don't want to give them up. Uh, in my last, my most recent publication on this, I detailed in excruciating detail, which I won't go into with you, on the IMF negotiations over shares. And this is uh, emblematic of the problem. Uh, Europeans will redefine what it means to have a share in the IMF uh, so they can protect their positions. And it's quite disarming to sit in the Russian foreign ministry or in Chinese ministries and have officials uh, know this excruciating detail and complain about how uh, they won't budge. And so if they won't budge, uh, these countries, these rising or emerging powers, and emerging economies, want to find their own voice and their own contributions. Um, and of course they want, I would argue, and I'll stop with this, not just the formal power that in some cases they've been denied, of course Russia and China both have seats in the UN Security Council, India and Brazil desperately want that uh, same power. But in the Bretton Woods governance structure, they want to be the rule makers while still free riding on the existing uh, institutions. They want to be having the formal power and I think even more important, the informal power. Where the informal power, you make decisions, you set the agenda behind the scenes and you also get to break the rules. Nothing aggravates these countries more than the fact that, that the US especially, and to some extent the Europeans, are hypocritical. That of course we engage in hypocrisy. We bypass the UN when it suits us. We use force without in, its imprimatur, yet we get upset when Russia's fighting a proxy war in, in, uh, in, um, in, in Ukraine or when China is its asserting its power uh, in the South China Sea. So uh, this informal power, which gives you the right to pass, make the rules for others uh, and sometimes be exempt from them is only possible if you have outside options. China has them and now we see some of these countries in informal partnerships, I don't wanna overstate how important the BRICS and these other institutions are, they're not. Uh, but when it suits their interests, they will coalesce with China to get, uh, to get their way. And our interest, Americans and Europeans, the transatlantic community, is to find a better path forward to deal with these challenges, because I think we've really failed so far. Thank you. So. I'm so much on the same page with Cynthia that I can be very quick. Uh, uh, let me uh, start by uh, talking about uh, Michael's point that the EU-Ukraine agreement was fully compatible with Ukraine's CIS membership. And um, when you say that uh, as a legal matter, I'm sure that that must be true and that the, uh, the negotiators thought about that. But as a functional matter, um, my question is, can a transparent rule of law market system be compatible with corruption, oligarchy, patronage, and rent seeking? You know, we have the folk sayings, the, the bad money drives out the good, or the rotten apple spoils the whole barrel. Um, you know, I don't know whether the answer to this question is obvious. It probably requires a lot of thought and analysis, but uh, I don't see how these things are easily compatible. Um, this matters because not only is that the old plan, but it's also evidently the new plan for Ukraine to have a barrel with half of the apples in it rotten 
and somehow hope that the rest of the apples are going to stay so juicy and succulent that uh, the, the people that are stuck with the rotten apples are going to say, oh, I wish we were in the part of Ukraine that had the, the, the good fruit. Uh, this is, I think, um, related to the, the largest issue and the one that Cynthia focused on raised by this whole report. Um, the introductory essay and the concluding essay to the report talk about, talked about the idea of moving from the current liberal rules-based order to, quote, a new rules-based order that would somehow um, accommodate non-Western illiberal powers ideas about rules into the system. And to me, this sounds like a barrel that has a lot of rotten apples in with the good ones. And, uh, and I think that this um, probably misconstrues the, the direction in which the international system is heading. Uh, instead of moving from liberal rules to new robust rules that are somehow not really liberal, I think we're moving more towards um, an international system that's going to be based not so much on rules, but is going to be based much more on bargaining, anchored in power and the self-interest of actors, uh, rather than rules. Um, now, Christina's uh, presentation pointed out that sometimes the uh, interests of, say, the Chinese in the Mediterranean can coincide with the interests of the Europeans, and based on pure self-interest, you can come up with a bargain where people will cooperate and uh, provide a collective good. But that's not because they're following rules, that's just a happenstance of uh, convergence of interest. Now, liberal rules have um, that they hang together and have a, like a, a rationale behind them. It's what Adam Smith said that liberal rules are a system that, you know, when they're working properly at any rate, they align private interest with public interest, the idea of the invisible hand. Um, illiberal social systems you know, they may have rules, but if they have rules, they're of a very different kind. They're the rules of clientelism, uh, and they're the, the rules, or maybe a better word is just strategies of mercantilism. And so illiberal states like China and Russia, I see as parasitic on the liberal world, where they're, as Cynthia said, free riding on uh, liberalism's rules. And the bargaining that is increasingly going on is over how much leeway to give the illiberal powers to free ride or cheat on uh, the rules of the system. And uh, as Cynthia says, it's not that the US doesn't cheat on its own rules, uh, but when the U.S. cheats on its own rules, it's at least some of the time with the purpose of trying to stabilize its system by, by going outside the rules. And, uh, and uh, I think that's an important distinction. Just um, briefly on Katerina, uh, the, the, who used the term securitization of discourse. And... Uh, uh, I, th I thought your analysis was, was good, but I, that term struck me as a euphemism for coercion by Russia. And I would rather not use that kind of euphemism um, s because uh, so it leads, this circles back to you know, my, my first point. So Poroshenko's uh, prescription for his country is uh, well, we're not going to really be able to stop coercion, naked coercion, exercise of brutal power by Russia. Uh, but we're going to win in the long run because we're going to have a, a better, more attractive social system. And 
Well, I don't think so, because I think Russia is going to use its coercive power to make sure that Ukraine stays a really unattractive social system with an economy that's dysfunctional. Um, and uh, so if we're talking about that, or if, or, or if we're talking about NATO's response to the Russian threat in the Balk Baltic, we're either going to have to, we, we can't just change the discourse to long run, uh, uh, the, you know, non-security uh, thinking. We're going to either have to exercise counter power, either military or a serious economic embargo, not just the kind of for show sanctions that we've had so far. Or otherwise, we're going to have to resign, our, resign ourselves to losing in the short run, losing Ukraine, possibly even using, losing the Baltics. Have you looked at a map? Um, and just wait them out until you know Russia once again collapses from its own shortcomings. Thanks. Very interesting. We're open for questions now. Build on yes. Uh, just maybe uh, building upon uh, Snyder. I think maybe I'm too realistic or something, but the idea of you know accountability and legitimacy. And we talk about different states and how they behave in the world of order, right? And we have these post-Western. And we talk about some states which actually, you know, have high degree of accountability. And we never actually, and we, we worked with other states and we didn't mention about this legitimacy of actually being in the world of order. I mean, you know, U.S. does not talk with Hamas about how the Middle East, you know, questions should be resolved. I mean, you know, I'm just kind of, why don't we also talk about, you know, what's driving the, the world order, right? If you talk about Germany, why does Germany doesn't lead Europe? It has to do probably with domestic politics, with its people, right? But we don't talk about Russia, why it's Russia is pushing for some kind of um, political uh, interest. Where does this come from? And why isn't this important in our understanding of the post-Western world, as you know? Um, Why don't we start with one of you? Do you want to respond? Um, well, I just wanted to maybe um, go directly to a more specific question on um, on Ukraine and Russia. Um, I don't think we disagree in our um, analysis of what's going on in Ukraine. I mean, there's, there's no way you can, you're going to have um, a wall along the, um, the current uh, ceasefire line and then um, a new economic miracle and, and, and you know, um, sudden um, unprecedented wave of democratization within the rest of Ukraine that's going to make, uh, you know, Ukrainians um, immigrate and, and whatever, you know, the others jump the wall like as if it were, um, we were back in 1989. Um, and this is exactly uh, my worry when I talk about the fact that this, the, the, the structural causes, which are really about this status quo of dysfunction, dysfunctionality, corruption, that, that suits Russia. Russia's, that's exactly what Russia's uh, playing to do. I mean, um, they don't have to invade physically Ukraine. They don't have to invade physically the Baltics. It, as long as this sort of climate, you know, this ability to have an impact on domestic politics in ways that, uh, that is debilitating, in ways that is um, creating instability in ways that is blocking the reforms, that, that's good enough. And, and there's, a, there's a whole regional part in, uh, there. So really, I mean, when Poroshenko says we're going to win in the long run, I mean, that's an election campaign also. I mean, that's what he has to say, but um, there's, not really, um, there's not really any serious basis for, for believing that's going to happen in the nearest future. So when I, um, just to sort of um, say the, the, the securitization um, term, uh, uh, the, the, the question is really, you know, there are two issues. The one is the question of how do we respond to the immediate crisis that erupted. The other one is the question of strategy. And what I was basically trying to argue is that we have to be thinking about both. You know, we obviously have to respond to a very concrete military threat and, you know, very um, concrete situation on the ground. Also to the fact that Crimea was annexed in a very peaceful way. But still, this is an unprecedented violation of international law. Right? Um, uh, and somehow 
um, it's, it's almost embarrassing that um, the international community, especially and the European community, reacted much more um, in a much more uh, passionate and, and out way, with much more outrage to to the accident that happened with the uh, with the uh, Malaysian flight, which was a terrible tragedy, but still one would argue an accident, and was so silent when when actually you know whole piece of territory got annexed um, in, in in such a blatant way, right? So. Um, I think, so there's a question of response and we shouldn't be really sort of trying to, to be nice to Russia just for the sake of being nice to Russia. But there's a question of strategy. What I'm saying is that if we only get stuck with this sort of very securitized thinking that oh, we are back, you know, and I was referring really to the sort of dominant debate, especially in Europe, we are back to the Cold War, it's all about containment, it's all about nuclear arms, who has them, who doesn't, that we're not, I think we are kind of lacking a more strategic vision of what um, European foreign policy should look like, what its regional policy should look like, and so I think these two things have to be brought together on the table for us to have a more um, fruitful and, and sort of productive discussion. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate very much uh, all of the comments, certainly from Jack and, and Cynthia, and, and, um, but I wonder whether the division of the world into countries which are liberal on the one side and illiberal on the other you know, is the end of the story. You know, there are countries where we know that rotten apples constitute half of the country, and these countries are basically irredeemable, and therefore, who are we trying to kid in believing that we can, in some way, extend aspects of a more liberal order, for example, through an EU trade and uh, agreement to these countries? I mean, you know, when we look back over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years, certainly after the Second World War, and shortly, well, and in, even in the 50s, the number of West European countries that were given up as hopeless cases. I mean, Italy was widely regarded as a completely hopeless case uh, because of corruption and bureaucracy and incompetence. Now, those problems haven't disappeared entirely, but, you know, it is one of the eight richest countries in the world, and it is functional, and there are aspects of rule of law that function there. Romania was regarded as a completely hopeless case. There are still you know, problems of corruption, rather petty on the whole. It's not the Soviet model. It's not the Bul Bulgarian model. Um, we've seen backsliding in Hungary, in Bulgaria, uh, to some degree in Croatia even, but they seem to be on a certain path. And I just wonder whether we have to give up on Ukraine entirely on the grounds that it's clearly illiberal, that corruption has reached such a degree, that the rotten apples are such that we can't really try and engage you know, those generations or others there who would like to see a different evolution. The same question to, to a certain degree exists even around the Mediterranean and in North Africa. We had an interesting meeting with Ganushi uh, from uh, another party in Tunisia the other day in Washington, and it's just conceivable that Tunisia, despite all the odds and all the refugees and all the smuggling across the border with Libya and so on, you know, is not necessarily in this winner-take-all kind of mode and might be open to some moves in this direction. So, you know, the, the view that who are we trying to kid, you know, really don't try and engage with these countries. They're part of another system, another view of the world. They're always going to react in this way. I think even China, you know, and Russia, I mean, the WTO has imposed certain constraints on, on China and, and so on. So I just rather wonder whether this sort of Manichaean view, I'm not fully Manichaean, but I mean, you know, bad apple countries and, and not, it really is the last word on, on, on their possible evolution. Uh, uh. Oh, actually, uh, can I respond also? Yes, please. Um, yeah, I just want to say on, um, you know, uh, the West or U.S. and Europe, and NATO engaging China on interest-based issues in the Mediterranean, we can leverage those interests, yes, they coincide, but then we can use that as uh, confidence-building measures as, uh, for a template to then forge um, a new consensus on global security norms. During the Cold War, U.S. and USSR, you've got a liberal bloc and you've got a liberal bloc. But we had agreements like incidents at sea, so that was maritime security. So we agreed, it was a 1972 agreement, and we agreed you know, on certain issues to prevent escalation accidents, like not dropping hazardous materials you know, near ships or, or, or you know, perform acrobatics over ships and what have you. So we actually um, achieved a normative consensus, even with a liberal bloc at that time. So that's what I'm saying, so we can leverage this and then build sort of new rules of engagement or some sort of modus vivendi. And in the in Gulf of Aden, that's sort of a micro example of what we can achieve. 
In Gulf of Aden, you have you know, NATO. It's very clear. You've got, you've got NATO, you've got EU NAV4, you've got US led combined maritime force, then you have you know, Russia and India and China and these other uh, and Japanese vessels there. But we have this um, cooperative mechanism called SHADE, you know, uh, Shared Awareness Deconfliction, so that we can coordinate and have some, some cooperative measures so that we don't bump into each other or have accidents. So, so that's sort of a, a basic template and confidence building measure to build these you know, sort of new rules of engagement and, and uh, uh, normative consensus, especially in the global commons for global security norms. Can I just uh, respond yeah. quickly because I wanted to say something before and I think uh, there's no question that you can have uh, cooperative interests come out of these cooperative security from incidents and see, which is a good example, um, to uh, working together in piracy as well, which is another one. And you mentioned a whole series of them. The problem, and I think we, we saw this in the long history of Russia-NATO cooperation, is the expected outcome of habits of cooperation then resolving the big security yeah. issues, it doesn't work. And I don't think it'll work any better in the U.S. or European or Western China relations than it did in Russia, uh, NATO. And for the basic reason that we have these fundamental differences and the cooperation at one level doesn't necessarily extend uh, to the higher yeah. level where political differences are much bigger. So I, I'm not sure that's been demonstrated from any of those cases that you go from one uh, set of uh, cooperative mechanisms. And the EU relationship with Russia is the same problem. Um, or with Ukraine, you know, everything but institutions. I and mean, this is just naive. The whole Eastern Partnership was naive to think that, that Russia, when it became powerful, wasn't going to object. And, and some of this could have been avoided. Russia's actually more economically reformed and less corrupt than Ukraine. And yet, uh, now everything has been said back. I don't want to overstate that, mm -hmm. but it has uh, worked harder at modernization. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. So, uh, in this talk, in this evening, I mean, uh, from the two uh, panels, so I find that some panelists uh, or discussions are pessimistic about the, the liberal world, uh, or the, some others are uh, something optimistic. Mm -hmm. Uh, here, I try to I mean, observe that from a different perspective. Let's uh, put uh, aside uh, liberal world order wire. Mm -hmm. That is to say, so today we, uh, so these two panels, we are discussing about the liberal world order. Actually, the background is the change of the world. And now, there, now that there is a change of the world, so uh, my question is, so after the Second World War, and uh, possibly we can also after the post-Cold World War, so the liberal World order uh, because it changed the world or uh, because it changed the world. So the implication is that we want to establish a new world order. And this new world order, I'm from China here. Yeah. So from China's perspective, okay, sure. Uh, I will not use this term, liberal world order. I will just say the new world order. Mm -hmm. The point here is, so a new world order, so who we are join to establish this new world order? Uh, what contents will be the new, new world order? How to create such, how to establish such a new world order? Uh, whether, whether I or you like or not, we just want a new world order, okay? This is very, very important. It's very fundamental to the world, the peace, the beauty of the world. And in this regard, uh, so I think uh, uh, whether you are from the West or from the East, whether you're from South or North, from China, America, Europe, Actually, we just have uh, here, we have sharing com commonality. That is, uh, we want to establish a new world order. This new world order based on rules. What kind of rules? Said uh, Professor Snyder just now, okay, based on this or that, or can different ideas put together, put into a battle? So here, I can, I think this is, uh, I mean, a topic we want to mm -hmm. discuss, yeah. discuss about. Maybe a little bit cold, but, yeah. My understanding, my prospect, or my expectation, or my wish, how is so we just want a new world order. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think what we should do is can someone respond to that? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and with that, we're going to tend to wrap this up because of time. OK, so I think we'll start with our panelists. Uh, and uh, you know, it's a big, big question. Well, I think it's a tremendous question to wrap up our discussion.
I'm afraid I can only answer it in the negative. I think the new world order, contrary to our expectations until recently, will not be achieved by just the progressive extension of the Western model being adopted by one group of countries after another, which was the way we tended to proceed until now. And uh, I think this new world order, if there is to be one, will be one where different conceptions of um, uh, the internal order of states and how they re relate to each other have to coexist. But I can see what it won't be, but I don't really see yet very clearly what it will be. I, I don't have much to add to, act to, to that, actually. I mean, I, I think it's increasing. There's, you know, devolution, increasing regionalism, and I think, you know, there's, like, you know, we're trying to beef up our uh, the own Western liberal order, you know, with TTIP and, 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 and you know, our allies, sort of democracies, you know, with, T, with uh, TPP, and to get our own house in order so we can project out again. And, of course, you know, China is a, a rising challenger. China and Russia, they are, you know, weaving their own blocks with the Eurasia Union or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. There's overlapping with BRICS that are, that are non-Western. So, you know, we have these emerging blocks, but I think we, could, we should still coordinate and have some sort of, you know, Modus vivandi, not necessarily uh, operandi, but vivandi of just you know peacefully coexisting, and that's why I focus on the global commons because it affects everybody, and so that's where we can you know achieve a lot of um, maybe some consensus on at least um, global security norms because these are emerging, these are new emerging non-traditional security challenges. We don't quite have an, uh, a normative, normative consensus on that yet because it's new. So this is a good opportunity for us to at least cooperate and reach some sort of consensus on these rising uh, issues and new norms, at least starting from this, this point. So it reads like the history of the European Union. It's not around any notion of ideals or great fathers, but negotiations. One doesn't even Functions. know that they're connected to creating a new order. Mm -hmm. Um, well, just very briefly, um, we have talked a bit about the question of you know what's liberal, the, the liberal bit in the world order. I think also the it, it basically summarizing what the others have said. Also, the bit about the order may be sending a sort of a, a somewhat too static a vision of, of international politics in the context which, as we as we recognize, is increasingly dynamic, is increasingly multipolar, and is also facing so many new threats, which by definition should um, provoke innovation and, and new forms of interaction, as opposed to sort of just trying to see whether the existing, you know, how to fit it with the existing rules. So I think, um, yeah, you know, um, uh, I would imagine that, you know, it's, 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 it's useful to start with the question, you know, what happened to the liberal world order, but that's clearly not going to be um, the kind of framework that's going to describe um, what's coming um, after, the, after that. Um, I agree with a lot of what's been said. I'll just add that I see order and governance as intimately connected with power and where there's a gap between the power holders or the rising powers and uh, our aspirations of governance, it's not going to work. So that requires those whose power is waning and I think this is mostly Europe, less so the US, so uh, need to either rejuvenate their power, uh, and I wish Europe especially would do this. It would be a better partner for the United States. It free rides as much as the rising powers do, in my view. Uh, and uh, then we would have a better ability to um, to find solutions to where to accommodate and where to resist mm -hmm. our differences with mm -hmm. powers that don't share our values. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm an optimist about the liberal domestic and international order. I think that uh, liberalism is a system that uh, has solved problems of authority and participation far better than any other a type of governance system that uh, the world has seen. Um, it's, you know, not the end state of the universe, but, you know, compared to what, el what else is in town, it's, you know, still the best pro product out there. Uh, um, illiberal states 
have historically been very successful at bursts of catch-up industrialization or economic development, um, but then after the easy growth phase that comes from um, bringing underutilized factors of production, especially labor, uh, into a kind of copycat version of the superficial aspects of liberal modernity. Uh, they run out of gas because they haven't solved the problem of authority and participation as well as liberalism does, and they come crashing down. Uh, or alternatively, they're uh, like China and Russia today, their economic uh, success is largely parasitical on uh, the consumer uh, economies that have been created by liberal capitalism. And that can only go so far until they come up with their own model. And uh, if, you know, if sometimes they then become liberal and solve their problem, and other times they don't become liberal and come crashing down. And I think that's what's going to happen again. How long? Yeah, 20, 30, 40. Yeah. Thank you enormously. Uh, and in order to introduce the book with us, and this is a good relationship. Absolutely. And that uh, for the spring, look forward, we're going to have a big conference on the Congress of Vienna. So mm. the global, what should we say, the yeah. European origins mm. of global governance. So mm. These questions are going to be debated in more slowly. Thank you for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.